What's up guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to discuss the August 2020 Midwest derecho. Now I'm going to apologize up front. Sometimes I say derecho because that's just what, how I learned it and that's how I've been saying it over the years. But as uh, Kayla has instructed me, it is derecho. Of course, I might be also saying it wrong. Maybe dad's <laughs> been right all this time, but I learned derecho, so. Apologies up front. So derecho, derecho. I think so. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to break it up a little bit. I'm going to talk about what is a derecho and then go actually into the event that happened. Now this has gotten a lot of attention back when it happened. Uh, in fact, it was actually described as one of the most costly severe thunderstorm events in US history. We'll dive into that in a little bit as well. But before we get started, Make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it and subscribe down below so you never miss the next Meteorology Monday. So we're going to ask a couple of questions first before we dive into the event. And the first question is, is what is a derecho? The origin of the term actually comes from the Spanish language, where derecho means direct or straight ahead. The National Weather Service's definition of a derecho is a widespread, long-lived windstorm associated with a band of rapidly moving showers or thunderstorms. Although a derecho can produce destruction similar to the strength of a tornado, the damage typically is directed in one direction along a relatively straight swath. As a result, the term straight line wind damage sometimes is used to describe derecho damage. By definition, if the wind damage swath extends more than 240 miles, or about 400 kilometers, and includes wind gusts of at least 58 miles per hour, or 93 kilometers per hour, or greater along most of its length, then the event might be classified as a derecho. Now let's ask the question, when and where do derechos occur in the United States? Most derechos occur during the summer months east of the Rocky Mountains and move eastward toward the eastern seaboard of the United States. They are most common and occur most frequently across the Midwest, Southern Plains, Mid-South, and Ohio Valley regions. The last question we're going to ask is, is how do derechos form? They form mostly in atmospheric environments where there is sufficient instability, causing thunderstorms, along with wind speed shear from the surface to the mid to upper portions of the atmosphere. Often very strong unidirectional winds just above the surface occur with derechos. As thunderstorms dissipate, the rain-cooled air from the outflow pushes forward, creating more upward motion and new storms are formed. This process can repeat itself for several hours. Now that we have a good understanding of what a derecho is, let's look at the August 2020 Midwest derecho event. During the overnight hours of August 10, 2020, scattered strong thunderstorms developed across south-central South Dakota. The storms were generally elevated in nature as they fed off of warm air above the ground. Air rising from the surface during the heat of the day was now aloft and fueling the strong storms. Isolated large hail up to one to two inches in diameter and a small swath of damaging wind gusts, 60 to 70 miles per hour, were reported. This was mostly due to the strong winds not reaching the ground due to the inversion, cool air at the surface, warm air aloft. The storms continued to move east-southeastward the rest of the night and as the sun started to rise. Out ahead of the storms, across the upper Midwest, temperatures were in the 70 degree Fahrenheit range with dew points in the low 70s. At the surface, winds were out of the south and southwest. The winds veered to a westerly direction aloft and increased in speed. This led to a lot of wind shear, which is known for prolonging the life of thunderstorms. The thunderstorms became more organized over eastern South Dakota and northeast Nebraska. This prompted the National Weather Service to issue statements on the increasing threat for widespread severe weather from the central plains eastward into the upper Midwest. The Storm Prediction Center issued a special update at 8 a.m. Central Daylight Time introducing an enhanced risk of severe weather over portions of eastern Iowa and northern Illinois. It was around this time that the storm complex approached Sioux City in western Iowa. Throughout the morning, temperatures across eastern Iowa all the way to Indiana warmed into the 80s by later that morning. This caused the instability to significantly increase. As the inversion layer diminished due to the warming of the surface layer, the strong winds were able to make their way toward the ground. Damaging wind gusts of 60 to 70 miles per hour were occurring more frequently across the upper Midwest. Around 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, these wind speeds would increase significantly as the storms approached Storm Lake, Denison, and Atlantic in west central Iowa. 
many areas across eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, some more than 50 miles away from the main storm complex, experienced numerous tree and power line damage as the strong winds got trapped under the inversion. So there we have the setup of a complex of thunderstorms occurring from the previous night and then the sun began to rise, these storms continued to grow and continue to propagate their way eastward and now we're starting to get to the heating part of the day and we're going to start to see some of the characteristics of this storm complex, this derecho form and continue to strengthen and impact more areas specifically in Iowa as we will talk about here in just a minute. Things really started to escalate between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time as the strong thunderstorm complex moved into central Iowa. Meteorological conditions had been fueling this storm system for hours. Now that the sun was heating and destabilizing the lower atmosphere even more, this caused a more rapid gain in strength. As the complex moved east of Denison, Iowa, a corridor of significant straight line winds ranging from 80 to 100 miles per hour plowed its way towards Ames and Des Moines. Winds in this range not only caused damage to trees and power lines, but also to crops, homes, and grain silos. As the organized storms barreled eastward, two paths of extreme winds ranging from 100 to 120 miles per hour would occur. The first path would start near Jefferson, Iowa, and continue eastward towards Madrid and Huxley. Numerous reports of damage to homes and businesses occurred, as this would be more closely related to a Cat 2, low Cat 3 hurricane, hence why some derechos are named inland hurricanes. Around 11.30 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the Storm Prediction Center upgraded their severe weather outlook to a moderate risk across central Iowa, northern Illinois, northwest Indiana, and southern Wisconsin. The second path would develop just northeast of Ames, Iowa, and extend toward the Marshalltown area around 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Three tornadoes would touch down near Marshalltown around this time. The National Weather Service would conduct surveys using satellite and drone imagery, as it was a challenge to determine what damage was caused by the tornadoes and what was caused by the straight line wind gusts propagating out from the thunderstorm complex. The National Weather Service would rate the strongest tornado as an EF-1. The severe winds would continue eastward, with the corridor of strongest wind gusts moving just north of the Des Moines area. However, 70 to 80 mile per hour wind gusts were still felt in Des Moines, causing a lot of damage to trees, power lines, and structures. The severe thunderstorm complex would continue to plow its way through central Iowa. Between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the storm system would produce Cat 2 to Cat 3 hurricane force winds east of Marshalltown through the Tama, Traer, Belle Plaine, and Vinton areas. Numerous reports of buildings such as barns, homes, mobile homes, apartment buildings, and businesses were damaged or destroyed, as well as grain bins, trees, crops, and power lines. Around 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the inland hurricane would reach the Cedar Rapids, Iowa region with its most destructive wind gusts yet. Maximum estimated wind gusts of 130 to 140 miles per hour would damage or destroy everything in its path. Estimated winds around 140 miles per hour were experienced near Wiley Boulevard and Wilson Avenue, where a roof was lifted off an apartment building and many exterior walls were blown down. Multiple homes received damage to roofs and walls, and a small strip mall was significantly damaged. One person was killed and numerous others were injured as the storm complex moved through. But unlike a typical severe thunderstorm, where winds would diminish after 10 to 20 minutes, this event would produce wind gusts greater than 60 miles per hour that would last for over an hour in some locations. The path of the wind gusts, equaling or exceeding 120 miles per hour, continued east-northeast across the heart of Cedar Rapids and into the northeast quadrant of the city. A brief tornado touched down near the eastern Iowa airport, south of Cedar Rapids but did not cause any damage that could produce an EF rating. As the strong core of the wind gusts moved into Marion, Iowa, estimated wind gusts of 130 miles per hour brought down a radio transmitter for WMT near the intersection of IA-13 and Radio Road. The storm complex would form an extremely strong line of storms and book their way east toward Quad Cities and Clinton, Iowa. At this time, wind gusts would start to diminish slightly, but were still Cat 1, Cat 2 strength with gusts roughly between 80 and 100 miles per hour. However, 
there was still a narrow corridor of more intense wind gusts estimated between 100 to 120 miles per hour occurring in the Clinton, Iowa area. Between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the storm complex formed a distinct line of storms approaching Princeton, Illinois. Estimated wind gusts of 100 miles per hour caused widespread tree damage and overturned numerous mobile homes in Forreston, Illinois, resulting in five injuries. As the line moved east, 90 mile per hour wind gusts overturned multiple semis along Interstate 80 and would continue to produce Cat 1, Cat 2 wind gusts between 80 and 100 miles per hour over a very large portion of Illinois. Around 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, new storms fired out ahead of the main line. One of these storms produced two tornadoes, rated EF0 and EF1, near the Rockford, Illinois area. Additional brief tornadoes occurred within the main line and impacted Kirkland, Marengo, Elburn, and Ottawa, Illinois. The tornado in Ottawa was rated an EF1 and damaged trees, power lines, and roofs. Minutes later, another tornado rated an EF1 touched down near Yorkville, Illinois, and would stay on the ground for almost 15 miles approaching Plainfield, Illinois. Four people were injured near LaSalle, Illinois as a result of straight line winds. Around 3.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the strong line of storms approached the greater Chicago metropolitan area. This line would continue producing a large swath of wind gusts 60 to 80 miles per hour, along with tornadoes on the lower end of the EF scale. A few notable tornadoes that were rated EF1 occurred in Wheaton, Lombard, and Spring Grove, Illinois. At 4 p.m., Cat 1 to Cat 2 hurricane force wind gusts of 80 to 100 miles per hour were felt over northern portions of Chicago and a brief EF1 tornado touched down as well. This would be the first tornado of EF1 or greater magnitude to occur in the city of Chicago since 1976. Between 4 and 5 p.m., brief tornadoes were occurring farther to the south in Midlothian Park Forest and Grant Park, Illinois, as well as Kentland, Indiana. Around 5 p.m., the line of storms produced wind gusts of 70 to 80 miles per hour over generally rural areas south of Gary and north of Lafayette, Indiana. An hour later, 60 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts were being felt over central Indiana, with two brief EF1 tornadoes occurring between South Bend and Warsaw, Indiana. Straight line wind damage became more scattered as the storms approached Ohio after 7 p.m. Not long after, wind gusts had diminished below severe limits and were no longer causing damage. One thing that was noted was a brief period of time along the southeast shore of Lake Michigan, where water levels rose about one and a half feet in St. Joseph, Michigan, causing some flooding in Lions Park Beach. The water level rise was due to the combination of rapid changes in atmospheric pressure and very strong winds. In summary, the August 2020 Midwest derecho produced damaging winds greater than 60 miles per hour occurred over an area of at least 90,000 square miles. Damaging wind gusts greater than 100 miles per hour occurred over an area of at least 2,000 square miles. Damaging wind gusts greater than 60 miles per hour occurred in many places up to 45 minutes after the initial line went through. Peak estimated wind gusts around 140 miles per hour were among the highest known to have occurred in a derecho. 26 weak tornadoes touched down during this event and their damage was similar in magnitude to that caused by the straight line winds. NOAA estimates this storm system caused more than 11 billion US dollars in damage, making it the most costliest thunderstorm event in recorded history for the United States up to this time. The crop damage was so extensive it could be seen on satellite imagery. Damage to power lines was also so extensive that power outages were visible from space at night. Widespread, long-duration power outages occurred across the area, with some parts of Cedar Rapids without power for about two weeks. More than half of the trees in Cedar Rapids were lost. What an incredible event. I remember when it happened, watching the satellite imagery pictures come out and you couldn't see the lights at night because of so many power outages, the crops being gone, and just seeing the swath of damage on satellite. For an event to be so big that you can see it on satellite from space is absolutely incredible. As well as I remember hearing stories from you guys on previous videos that we posted about derecho events and hearing the first-hand experience you guys had from this event was 
just as crazy. And we were also able to look at other uh, videos posted on YouTube yeah. uh, of the actual event and it was just absolutely incredible. There was one video where it was a construction site. They were building this home and it was a very strong home. The initial line came through and they're recording for up to 45 minutes later and the winds are still blowing things around, moving his construction trailer, blowing out windows, even many, many, many minutes after uh, the initial line went through. So just an incredible event. I've, I've never seen a derecho last no. that long, that strong. The costliest severe thunderstorm event. I mean, you often hear these things talked about with tornadoes and hurricanes, but this was just a line of thunderstorms and we're seeing, I remember growing up in Florida, there were a lot of hurricanes. The damage coming out of there looked like the Florida East Coast after a hurricane would go through. You had flooding in some areas, you had the wind damage, you had tornado damage, and the amount of time it took to distinguish between what was a hurricane or straight line wind damage, what was tornado damage, because some have swirly winds, some have straight winds, but when it initially happens, I mean, the damage done to the crops and the houses and even sturdier buildings and trees and power lines, it all kind of looks the same in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. And that's why it's called an inland hurricane. As with all of our previous case study videos, everything that we use to put this together and videos and stuff, if you want to check it out for yourself, will be linked down below. Thank you to all of you who have already commented about your experience with this story show, as well as those of you who suggested us doing this case study. If you want to leave a comment below with a future case study suggestion, we'd love to read about those as well. We do have a long list of case studies that we are trying to get to, so this is a very long list. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, significant events out there. Uh, significant events and a lot. Of research to go into yeah. it to you know paint an accurate picture of what's going on it does take us a while so bear with us we'll get there so there you have it the 2020 Midwest derecho event again if you like what you saw be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss the next one follow us over on social media Facebook and Instagram popping up here as well as checking out our school of weather if you're interested in learning about the basics of meteorology but you don't want to do the calculus that comes with going to school for it until next time I'm Kayla and I'm Jim thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. Now, is it Duratio? Is it Derico? It's not Derico. Duratio. We are going so. to get the official... Everyone is out. Oh, Lord, here we go. Definition. Derecho? Derecho. 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 Like nacho, only derecho. <laughs>